this is a paper in which we uh, investigate whether fiscal policy during COVID uh, was effective both at the micro level in helping uh, small and medium enterprises to stay afloat during uh, uh, the pandemic, and also at a more macro level and whether it helped sustain economic activity and what kind of spillovers it generated across countries. Now, just to start with, I'm going to illustrate the uh, differences in scale in fiscal policy across, across countries during the pandemic. This, this figure here shows you on the left for a group of advanced economies, the size of the uh, fiscal spending and foreign revenues in 2020 as a share of GDP. And it averages about 16% of GDP across all these advanced economies. So clearly, uh, as the pandemic occurred in the first quarter of 2020, um, governments everywhere sort of jumped in and, and put in place a variety of programs uh, with the idea that uh, much support was needed to uh, keep the economy afloat. Now, the same thing happened in emerging economies. As you can see on the right side of the, of the uh, screen here, uh, we have a sample of um, a number of uh, emerging market economies, but on a much smaller scale, in part due to limits to the fiscal space that a number of these countries have. So on average, the fiscal support in emerging market economies was around 5% of, of GDP. Now, what we ask in, in this paper is first, we focus on small and medium enterprise. And we ask, did the fiscal policy programs that were put in place, did they provide enough liquidity support to struggling SMEs and uh, in doing so help reduce uh, uh, business failures? Then we're gonna shift our focus uh, to the more macro side and ask whether the fiscal programs more generally, not just those for SMEs, whether those help support aggregate activity more broadly. And then finally, uh, we're gonna ask whether uh, the speedovers, uh, cross country speedovers from fiscal policy were important. In other words, whether the large fiscal programs we saw in advanced economies, whether these programs helped also lift the tide and, and prop up economic activity in emerging markets. Now, our main message uh, after we do all this uh, is that fiscal policy was in fact very effective in getting in, into all of the cracks of uh, the economy, but it was mostly effective domestically. And therefore, uh, it requires a lot of fiscal space. And so to preview a little bit, one of the main results we're going to obtain is emerging market economies did not get much support from large fiscal programs in, in advanced countries. All right, so let me start with the first part of our research agenda on this. But we start with a, a model of individual firms operating in different sectors and, and embedded in, in a rich input-output structure with uh, an extensive margins, we take into account business failures, et cetera. And we, in that framework, we represent COVID-19 as a combination of uh, country and time-varying supply, demand, aggregate, and sectoral shocks. And let me, let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. Uh, COVID-19 is, of course, a very complex shock that hit uh, uh, most economies in the world. On the supply side, we can think of COVID-19 as a shock that prevents firms from keeping all their workforce, workforce employed. Um, a number of workers had to be sent home during, during lockdowns. Uh, they were only able to operate with, uh, with a reduced uh, uh, scale. Uh, and so we're going to capture this and we're going to measure this using uh, data on the feasibility of remote work uh, that we obtained for, uh, for the US from the ONEP uh, database. And we're gonna cross this with measures of the strictness or the intensity of the lockdown policy across different countries. Now on the demand shock, COVID-19 also had large effects. It reallocated expenditures across different sectors of the economy. You wouldn't go to restaurants, maybe you would order more groceries online, things like that. And so we are going to also measure this from data on uh, uh, how, how reliant sectors and businesses are on face-to-face -face interactions at uh, a finely disaggregated sectoral level. And we're going to interact that with an intensity index that comes from Google Mobility that tells us whether people are actually traveling a lot or going to uh, places of business outside their own home. Uh, of course, there's also an aggregate side to COVID-19. As the pandemic hits, a lot of people may decide to cut down spending. There's an uncertainty component to it. And, and so that's also something that we're going to, we're going to fit in. Now, with all this input into the model, we're able to calculate which firms are going to survive based on liquidity criterion, whether they're able to meet their financial expenses with uh, their available cash flow uh, and the cash balances. Now, when we do all this, we are going to calculate a, a failure rate in a situation without fiscal support. 
And then we're going to turn on fiscal support. And we turn on fiscal support calibrated to what we've observed in many countries in terms of uh, fiscal policies or fiscal programs uh, of the form of, in the form of tax waivers, cash grants, or pandemic loans. Now, in the case of the pandemic loans, what's important to realize is that this is not necessarily a, a, a cost to the government. The expectation is that many, many, maybe most of these loans will be repaid as businesses exit the, the, the pandemic and the lockdown but they are dispersed through the banking system with a government guarantee. Now, this uh, slide here illustrates the, on the left side, our measure of the sectoral supply shock. So the reduction in uh, the, uh, the size of the labor force that you can still employ across different sectors at the one digit level. You can see that sectors like accommodation and food, so reduction in their workforce of about 80 to 90% at uh, uh, the sort of the highest point of the lockdown, if you want, uh, while other sectors didn't see any reduction in orange here on this figure, you see the essential sectors, there was, there was no reduction in, 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 in labor supply in, in essential sectors. On the right, what you see are the sector specific demand shocks due to the reallocation of demand that we can, we can measure. And again, here you see very large reallocation of demand in sectors like entertainment and recreation or other services and some increase in relative demand in, in the essential sectors, again, in orange. Now, when we input all this into, into our model, we uh, calculate that the failure rate of small and medium enterprise would have increased substantially during COVID in the absence of government intervention. So the number that uh, we, is important here on the slide is this 9% here. That's the, that means that there would have been 9% of small and medium enterprises would have failed in 2020 in the absence of government intervention to help small and medium enterprises. Now, when we turn on uh, the fiscal program and scale them to what we observe in the data, we find that this number is still high, about 4.3%, but much smaller than the 9% uh, uh, overall. And so our first result is that fiscal support did help reduce SME failure substantially. Now, there is also an interesting result when we break down the data uh, um, according to which uh, advanced versus emerging market economies. So for instance, we find that for advanced economies, fiscal support was so strong that in fact, it even reduced the failure rate below that of a normal year. So the uh, calculated uh, failure rate in 2020 would in fact be about half a percent lower than in a normal year. And that of course is due to the very sizable uh, um, scale of the support to SMEs, about 6% of GDP, uh, in, in advanced economies. By contrast, for emerging market economies, there's still a very sizable increase in, in, in business failures. So there is a, a large effect of fiscal programs. There's also a heterogeneity across countries. Now, the second and third result is that these this programs were effective, but they were relatively poorly targeted. We can go back and look firm by firm at the firms that received support and ask ourselves, did they really need it? And in fact, we conclude that about 90% of the funds that were dispersed, the 90% of the, uh, uh, of, of the support to SMEs went to firms that would have survived even without any support. So in a sense, governments just used existing pipes and disbursed money very, very broadly, probably because in, you know, in the midst of battle, you, you can't really do microsurgery. You, you don't exactly know which firms are going to need it. So you have, you have to be very, very broad. Um, and remember, uh, a lot of this funding is coming through pandemic or government subsidized loans, so a lot of it could be also coming back as uh, uh, the economies emerge from, from COVID-19. COVID Another important result is that we find very little evidence of quote-unquote zombification of the economy. If we ask ourselves, have we propped up all these SMEs, but then as soon as the economy is going to recover and we pull back on support, are we going to face a wall of business failures? And the answer, according to our simulations, is no. We find a very modest increase in the failure rate, about 2.6 percentage point overall, uh, as the economy normalizes, but certainly not uh, those 9% or 5% have been preserved, sort of coming down the pike and, and, and just uh, exiting en masse. So there's no evidence of that. So to the first question we set out to answer, which is did fiscal support provide enough liquidity to struggling firms? Our answer is yes, despite poor targeting, it did reduce SME failures and did so without, at least as far as we can tell, without creating a lot of zombies. Now we turn to the sort of the macro and the global side. And we ask there, um, is there, what was the effect of fiscal programs more generally in propping up economic activity? And we do, to do so, we build a global dynamic heterogeneous agent general equilibrium model with uh, uh, nominal rigidity, so there's a role for aggregate demand, but also, and importantly, this is what you see illustrated on the slide, 
a fairly rich and detailed global trade and production network to take into account all these linkages, both between sectors, this is what you see on the right side of the, of the slide, but also across countries through trade networks, this is what you see on the left side of the slide. Um, and so what do we find when we do this? Well, first, there is an important distinction that uh, uh, we need to emphasize, a distinction between supply and demand constrained sectors. COVID-19 is going to create a lot of supply bottlenecks. There are a lot of sectors where workers are not able to produce. There are, and we hear about this in the news all the time about supply chain bottlenecks these days. In this sector, fiscal support is not going to be able to increase economic activity. The only thing it might do is maybe increase prices, but it's not going to boost economic activity very much. But there are also demand constrained sectors, sectors where demand ex exceeds the productive capacity at a given point in time, maybe because that productive capacity has been curtailed. And therefore, in those, in those sectors where you have demand constraints, if you boost, if you boost demand, you might be able to uh, overall improve activity in that sector and maybe more broadly in the economy overall. And here, our estimates are that about 31% of global GDP occurred in demand constrained sectors. In other words, there is room there's room for fiscal policy to improve matters. About a third of GDP is taking place in sectors where there is insufficient demand, if you want. Now, when we calculate what is the effect of those large fiscal programs, this 16% uh, in advanced economies, about 6% in, in, in emerging ones, what is the effect on global output? We can do this in our model by turning off fiscal policy everywhere and then turning it back on and seeing the difference. And we find that the increase in output linked to these fiscal programs is relatively modest. It's about 0.7% of GDP. This is a number in red here on this table. Now, remember, the fiscal impulse was large. On average, across all countries, it was about 11.3%. So if you do just a simple division, you come up with an incredibly tiny fiscal multiplier, 0.06. For every dollar spent, only about six cents uh, improvement in aggregate activity. You might conclude this is just, this is just an extremely low number. This is very, very close to zero. But we want to argue that this is somewhat misleading. It's misleading in part because remember, we started with COVID-19 creating a lot of supply bottlenecks. And in those sectors that are supply constraints, fiscal support is not going to be able to increase activity. What it's going to be able to do is going to be able to reallocate demand from supply constrained sectors to demand constrained sectors. And we find substantial evidence that it does this. Where do we see this? Well, if we look at what we call Canadian unemployment, which is a measure of the slack in the labor market in sectors that face demand constraints, we find that this Canadian unemployment is reduced from about 2.67% to about 1.4% thanks to fiscal support. So it's reduced by almost, you know, 1.3%, uh, 1, 1 uh, not quite half, by, uh, uh, by fiscal policy. So this is a situation where fiscal policy should not be expected to boost output after all workers were sent home, they couldn't produce, but it was able to prop up activity in sectors that face demand deficiencies and close the close the output gaps in these sectors. The, th the final result is to look at global speedovers. So here the question was, well, if emerging market economies are not able to uh, uh, implement large fiscal programs, can they rely on the large fiscal programs implemented in advanced economies to help them along? And so to answer that question, I'm, I, we're going to run a little experiment. We're going to turn off fiscal policy everywhere. And then we're going to turn it back on, but only in the US. And that will allow us to look at the effect of fiscal policy in the US on the US itself, of course, but also of the effect of fiscal policy in the US on other countries that we have in our, in our sample. And this is the graph that you have on the left here. You see every country is a, is a bar, and we see the change in output relative to the baseline of no fiscal policy due to US fiscal policy only. Now, not surprisingly, US fiscal policy increases, improves, US output, sorry, improves thanks to uh, US fiscal policy. It improves modestly by about 1.5%. The amount of spending in the US was closer, you know, slightly above 20%. So the multiplier is not huge there either, but it, 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 there's a significant effect. But notice that for most other countries, with maybe the exceptions of very close trading partners like Canada and Mexico, and of course that reflects the, the, the sort of the trade and global production network, for most other countries, the effect is small and negative. In other words, spillovers, if there are any, as far as we can tell, are relatively small, and moreover, they tend to be negative. Now, when we unpack this result, what we find is that what's driving this is, in fact, the fact that fiscal policy in a group of countries or in a single country tends to drive up interest rates globally, and this increase in interest rates globally tends to hurt other economies in, in the world. Now, again, 
There's a disconnect between output and employment here in the sense that even though fiscal policy in the US doesn't help output in other countries, it does help reduce very modestly, but it does help reduce Canadian unemployment in, that, in these other countries. So our conclusion is that fiscal spillovers to output are small and negative, spillovers to employment uh, are small and positive. Now, in the paper, we run a little bit of a, a, a forward-looking scenario where we ask ourselves, okay, well, given all these results, what can we anticipate if we have a two-speed recovery? So if um, advanced economies, thanks to a successful vaccination program, can emerge from COVID-19, while emerging market economies maybe are lagging behind because the vaccination program maybe has not been as successful uh, or they're lacking access to the vaccine uh, and therefore the economy is still subject to, uh, to sectoral uh, 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 supply and demand shocks. And what we find there is, is that the two-speed recovery is actually uh, something that could hurt emerging market economies for the same reason that the speedovers are small and negative. In other words, as advanced economies are uh, booming ahead, and we have projections, like growth projections for 2021 and maybe 2022 that are very, very strong for many economies. What we can anticipate is a, a, a rebound in, in global interest rate, and that rebound in global interest rate is sort of exerting a drag on emerging market economies are still subject to the COVID-19 shock. And so in our simulation, what we find is that emerging market economies could even experience a decline in output growth in 2021 and, and, and in 2022 relative to uh, 2020. So to conclude here, the exercise was to sort of assess the extent to which fiscal policy was getting into all of the cracks. And we conclude that it does, um, mostly domestically. SME fundamentals are quite strong, especially in advanced economies, thanks to the very generous, generous fiscal support these countries received. Multipliers from fiscal policy are very small, but this is to be expected. These are transfer programs, which typically have relatively low multipliers. There are supply bottlenecks. And in the paper, we explain that IO linkages also tend to reduce even further these multipliers. Further, the cross-border speedovers are relatively small, so countries are a little bit on their own. They have to rely on their own fiscal space, on their own vaccination programs, if you want, on their own policy in order to, in order to exit the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And that's uh, uh, where I will end. Thank you.